Let me do a real quick, and I mean real quick review, because I one thing that always bugs me when we're doing little series is when someone spends 30 minutes reviewing the, the lesson before. It's like, you know, why'd we set through it if we got to set through a half an hour of hearing it again? So not going to do that. But we're talking about the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was that box, for lack of a better word, from the Old Testament, a box that was covered in gold, both on the outside and the inside. And the children of Israel would put it out in front of them as they moved through the land. And as the Holy Spirit would move, they would move and follow the Spirit, cloud by day, fire by night. And as they followed the cloud by day and the fire by night, wherever the cloud or the fire stopped, they would put the Ark of the Covenant in that spot. They'd build the tabernacle around it and they'd pitch their tents facing inward, by the way. Their backs always faced the world. Their face always faced the presence of God as a type and shadow that our eyes are on Him and He has our back. So we never had to worry about the attack from the rear because He said, I will be your rear guard. He told the prophet Isaiah that. So that actually still stands for us today. We look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, the centerpiece of our Christianity, and our back is covered by the Holy Spirit. This is also why if we'll put Jesus in the center of our churches, our sermons, and our songs, we won't have to worry about our back because the Holy Spirit has the back whenever our eyes are on Jesus. A lot of times we're so focused on the wolf or we're so focused on the lion or we're so focused on defending truth, fighting the devil, standing up for God, all the things we like to think are real Christian. Yep. And when you do that, you have to turn to face the enemy. And Israel wasn't allowed to turn away from the Ark of the Covenant to face the enemy. They faced the Ark and God took care of the enemy. When God wanted them to face the enemy, what did he do? He picked the cloud and the fire up and he moved right in front of their enemy and they took the Ark of the Covenant out there and now they're facing the Ark while facing their enemies. And so the victory is won for us. How do we apply that in Christianity? The victory is won for us by seeing Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And as we're watching Jesus out in front of us, the Holy Spirit's got our back, Christ's out in front of us. We don't have to worry about our enemies. Because right. he sets between us and the enemy. He sets between us and the chaos. He sets between us and the darkness. So the Ark of the Covenant then functioned as the presence of God. Once Jesus comes, this is where we're heading to in this little series, but once Jesus comes, we want to graduate up past being the Ark of the Covenant. We're not Ark of the Covenant people. We don't have a box up here tonight covered in gold with cherubs on top of it and a little crown around it and staves, and then we carry it around Westminster, South Carolina and drop it like the Holy Spirit's there. We don't have to do that because we're not looking for the Holy Spirit in a tangible cloud by day and a fire by night because what we are is not disciples of a box or the Ark of the Covenant. We're not even disciples of the Bible, but we are disciples of Christ. And Christ said, I won't leave you orphans. If I go away, I'm going to leave the Holy Spirit. It's going to be your comforter. So the Holy Spirit that used to be manifested by the cloud by day and the fire by night is now the cloud by day and the fire by night inside of you. Yeah. Okay, that's actually where I want to take you to tonight, because what we did last night was talk about that ark. And by the way, what I, most of what I just told you was not review. Most of what I just told you was new, yeah. built on top of the idea of the ark. So our review there was actually about 20 seconds of, hey, last night we preached about a box called the Ark of the Covenant. But on top of that, wh where, where we want to go with that. So last night I talked about, um, and, and this is for those who might watch these videos later, and you go, I'd like to hear that first sermon. It was called Out with the Old and In with the New. You can look that up under that title. And out with the old and in with the new is really just saying, get rid of the old, pick up the new, but be careful how much of the old you get rid of. Listen to the sound of the Spirit on what you get rid of that's old, but follow the Holy Spirit who never is living in the past. The Holy Spirit never comes to us and goes, you know, I want it to be like it used to be when your grandpa was alive. Yeah, I wish your church would be like it was when you first got here. You'll never hear God do that. Because God doesn't walk backwards. And so as God's walking forward, he's walking us forward into the things that he has for us today. This is why it says God's doing a new thing. How many of you realize he's always doing a new thing? Okay. So as God's always doing a new thing, it's out with the old and the new. Tonight I want to title it, The Tomb Becomes a Womb. 
And I want to do that because as we ended last night, I brought out that the Hebrew word for ark in Ark of the Covenant is the word for coffin. And so if we translated it literally, it would have been the coffin of the covenant, which doesn't hit our ear right. Because why would God tell them to build a coffin? Because what do you put inside of coffins? The dead. So why would God tell them to build a coffin and then put the, ark, put the Ten Commandments inside of it? And then why would you carry it around with you everywhere you went? Because, and, and so I'm not saying that Israel understood it this way, but we're not Israelites living in the Old Testament. We're followers of Jesus living in the New Covenant. So it's how we perceive it under the New Covenant is really the purposes of preaching the gospel. We're not trying to understand God through the lens of an ancient Hebrew. We're trying to understand God through the lens of Jesus. And so as Christians, on the other side of the resurrection, the other side of the ascension, I say this to you. How do we perceive it when we look back and go, hey, they were carrying a coffin around with the Ten Commandments inside of it. And what does that indicate? And so what it indicates to us is that if we have a New Testament precedent for walking from the description of the Ark of the Covenant on into something new, then we need to find that precedent and follow it. And to do that tonight, I want to take you to the book of Hebrews. I want to read from chapter 9. If you'll remember last night, we worked on the last verse of chapter 8. We worked on the first five verses of chapter 9. But I want to start in verse 6 of Hebrews chapter 9. And I just want to slow walk through some texts. Tonight's a little reedy, R-E-A-D-Y. I'm going to read a little bit, all right? And all I really am trying to do is not get, not, not get too technical, not just exhaustive exegetical work in the Bible, but just lay these texts out in front of you and let you watch how the author of the book of Hebrews progresses the knowledge of the Holy Spirit setting on the Ark of the Covenant into something brand new. Because remember, the old is passing away, the new is coming in. And so what does the new look like versus the old? Verse 6, Now when these things had been thus prepared, these things were the Ark of the Covenant, the Table of Shubra, all the stuff we read about last night. All right? When they had been prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle, the front room, and they performed the services of the Lord. They did what they had to do. They trimmed the candles. They freshened up the shoe bread. They, did, they, they waved the incense, which was the, a type of the presence of the Lord or the worship of the Lord in the, in the holy place. Verse 7. But into the second part, that's behind that veil we talked about, what's also called the Holy of Holies. What's back there? The Ark of the Covenant. Into that part, the high priest went alone, and he only went once a year. And he never went back there without blood. Because he first went in there and offered blood for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. So you didn't get to go behind the veil without shed blood because shedding of blood was seen to be the atonement for our sins. We would shed the blood of bulls, goats, lambs, pigeons, turtle doves. We didn't shed the blood of the actual sinner. I point this out, I know it's obvious, but we don't think about it enough in the church. And if we would think about it more, we would realize why old covenant sacrifices never make us feel right. Because we know old covenant sacrifices, bulls, pigeons, turtle doves, goats, lambs, those things didn't do anything wrong. What did the bull do wrong? He didn't do anything. He just stand out there eating grass. Somebody comes along, conks him on the head, slits his throat, takes his blood and offers it up for your sin. Well, you're the one messed up, not the bull. So the bull just constitutes something else. But we are the ones with the mistake. And I think that filters down into all old covenant style penance. If I were to say to you, Abe, you messed up this week, you need to do this, this, and this for the Lord so that the Lord will bless you. you, you might go out and do this, this, and this, but it never feels quite adequate because you know in a sense that God is so much larger than you. What could you possibly do to live up to God? And this is why when you keep people under old covenant style performance, there's always chaos and death and anger in a church. Or in a society, because we know we can't live up to the mistake that's been made. That's deeply inbred in us. The bull didn't do anything wrong. I did. My blood should be the one shed. And so it's already, we're already behind the eight ball. 
Because no bull, no bull, no lamb, no goat can possibly pay for me. I'm the one who needs to pay for me. So he goes in with the blood to offer it for himself and to offer it for the people's sins committed in ignorance. Verse 8. The Holy Spirit indicating this. It's the Holy Spirit's doing, by the way. That the way into the holiest of all, that's behind this curtain, that's in the Holy of Holies. The way into the Holy of Holies was not made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. Ooh, here's an interesting twist in the story. So God is telling us through the author of Hebrews that as long as there was an actual physical tabernacle on the earth where you were killing actual lambs, there was no access into the actual Holy of Holies. Yeah. There was only the Holy of Holies you had behind that curtain. But you couldn't get in the real Holy of Holies because you had your own natural Holy of Holies, which is another way of saying that everything that you have that is tangible in your religion that you can put your hands on is most often a substitute for the intangible thing that's invisible that is actually more valuable than the things you can get your hands on. And so it is a, a matter of going beyond that natural tabernacle into that supernatural tabernacle, and the Holy Spirit is doing the work in that. Verse 9, it was symbolic for our present time. And of course, he's not in 2022. He's somewhere in the mid-60s AD, probably, the book of Hebrews. So for our present time, he goes, that tabernacle was actually a symbol in which gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. So you could offer lambs, pigeons, turtle doves, bulls, rams, goats, but it actually did not perfect your... Now please catch this last line. It did not perfect your conscience. And one of the reasons I, was, I pause right here is because most of what we've been preaching to people is to try to get them to perfect their actions. Okay? Yes. Clean up the way you act. Right. Get out here and live better. And most of us think that's the church's job. The author of Hebrews says, let's don't even get there yet. We'll get there in a little bit. Don't even go there yet. It didn't even work in your conscience, much less your actions. Yes. It couldn't even clean up the way you felt about yourself, much less the way you lived. And here's why that's important. Because how you feel about yourself will actually influence the way you live. So if you think you're a dog, you'll live like one. If you think you are guilty, you'll live like you're guilty. If you think like you're a piece of trash, you'll act like a piece of trash. If you think, like, if you think you're valuable, you might treat yourself as if you're valuable and that you matter and that your body matters and your mind matters and your soul matters. And if you matter, then maybe he matters. And if he matters, then maybe you should treat him better. Because if he matters as much as you matter, then he matters a lot. But if you don't matter, then maybe he don't matter either. See what happens in the world? I mean, I'm nothing. Who's he think he is? And then the spiral goes downward in every person we meet. So the author of Hebrews hits on something very important. God has to work on who we are in here so that it can have an effect on what we do out here. And we've just been working on what people do out here and ignoring what happens in here. So they come in, we go, I don't know what you've been doing this week. And all we're really doing is addressing the out here. Yeah. You need to change your clothes, change your hair, change your body, change your do the way you've been acting, change the way you've been talking, change the places you've been going. And inside, nothing's changed. Right. And so God is way more important with fixing the conscience of his people, which is what happened to us in the garden when we ate from the wrong fruit. The wrong tree is our conscience was violated. And with a violated conscience, we go live like the enemy. And we become the enemy in our own mind because God's not our enemy. We just make God out to be our enemy because our conscience is messed up. This is why you cannot preach to people enough who they are in Christ. Yes. Just can't overdo it. You can't say it too much. I didn't say it's all you got to say. Because I've been guilty of that too. Just sermon after sermon on who you, here's who you are in Christ. Here's who you are in Christ. Here's who you are in Christ. Until people are only hearing who they are in Christ and they never hear what to do with it. And sometimes you need to hear what to do with it because the world needs you to show up. Yeah. Right. right? Okay. So past the conscience and into action, but we're going to start with conscience. And then verse 10. Concerned only with food and drink. Various washings, fleshly ordinances, imposed in the time of Reformation. 
This is the natural tabernacle. The natural tabernacle, just it, all it talks about is what you eat. It talks about the various washing. It talks about natural ordinances, feast days, new moons. Paul would say it this way, feast days, new moon, Sabbaths. All the stuff that's on the outside, the natural tabernacle is obsessed with it until the time of Reformation. All right. I, I, wanted, I, I now want to turn a corner with you. I've, I've, kind of, I've kind of pushed ahead just a little bit out of this text into the next segment by already telling you that there's transition coming. I'm, I'm really just trying to show you what's coming around the corner. But I want you to watch the root of rebuttal. Okay, if you say something and I rebut it, by rebutting it, I'm not saying you're an idiot, you're stupid, that's a dumb idea. I'm giving you an alternate way to think. And we say it with the word but. We use that conjunction. Here's how I feel, but I also feel this way. Or here's truth, but here's something else to think about, right? Rebuttal is not a bad thing. The Bible rebuts itself all the time. In that, it gives you a truth and then it goes, but there's more information. And so sometimes I think a lot of us in, in our spiritual walk are just caught in front of the conjunction. We just haven't listened long enough for the Holy Spirit to say, but... And I've done that in grace. I've been like, you're the righteousness of God in Christ. Here's who the Bible says you are. And I'd stay on that so long, I'm just preaching in front of the rebuttal. Because there's a rebuttal where the Holy Spirit goes, but there's some other stuff I'd like for you to know about yourself. And so all of us at one place in our lives are just a step in front of the conjunction. We're just a step in front of the rebuttal. Letting the Holy Spirit show us that there's more than me. See, this is why I won't judge you where you are. Okay? I don't think the church has a right to. I won't judge where you are. I've probably been where you are. I may not yet be where you are, but you're probably, you're just on a different, because really a rebuttal's a turn. Here's information, here's information, here's information, but here's more information. Look at this, we just made a left. And so when we're making our journey, I see you on the journey, but I might have made this turn and you're back here and haven't made this turn. You might have made a turn I haven't yet made. And what we do is we always judge people on the other spots in the road because they're not in our spot. Okay? And, and we do that to our detriment because we don't realize that our entire Christian journey is not a straight line. Somewhere along the way, we all got lied to and told that it's a straight line. From here to glory. It's like you get saved and then it's just this upward trick. No, it's a twists and turns and ups and downs and lefts and rights and loop-de-loops and down into the valleys and up over the hill. And you don't always see where everybody else is. That's why you just get your judgments off of other people's journey. Because there's a conjunction. There's a turn. Watch the turn. But Christ came as high priest. So you got all your Old Testament stuff. It's good stuff. Makes for a great lesson. You can put up your gold and your shoe breads and your candlesticks and your curtains and you can put your arcs of the covenant back there. And you can do all this teaching about blood sacrifice and everything, but Christ. So there's this turn in the gospel story where God goes, oh, none of that's wrong. That's all right. That's all good. Tabernacle stuff's good. Yeah, fire by night, fire by night, cloud by day. Yeah, good stuff. Bloods of the, but Christ. And I think a lot of us have gotten so enamored of all of the other stuff that we didn't follow the but Christ, but Christ, but Christ. I like to say this to people. I, I, I know I'm slowing down here, but I'm doing it for a reason. We're not going to get through this tonight if I don't speed up. But let, let me just say this and we'll move on. Gosh, sometimes I just want just two words in people. When I hear stuff that's preached and said, I just want to go, but Christ. Go, yeah, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. And I go, but Christ. Yeah, and people are, you know, they're living like they never lived before. And we go, but Christ. Did, what did Christ do? But Jesus. Jesus came so that things could happen. Jesus came so you could change your perception. Jesus came so you could change your mind. Follow the conjunction. Follow. Go where he goes. But Christ. And I realize we're not all on that spot. And so I'm not being judgmental. And there's people that are way back on the name and hit the but Christ yet. And it's time to hit the but Christ and run with Jesus and go where Jesus goes. Christ came as a high priest of good things. Not that we're here but of good things to come. So Jesus walks right into a world full of temples with gold coverings and shoe bread and candlesticks and dead lambs. And he comes as a high priest of stuff you can't yet see. And he does it with a greater and a more perfect tabernacle. And the author goes, it's not made with hands. It's, 
it's not of this creation, which is a great word because it means whatever is made of the hands of Jesus is a new creation. He takes old stuff and he makes new stuff. So whatever you've inserted into Jesus, he buries as the old and he brings out the new. And this is why we keep preaching Jesus so that you'll deposit your junk into Jesus. Because if you put your junk into Jesus, he makes things not made with your hands. So then it manifests into your life as new stuff. Listen, this is why some of us have come into grace and we've thrown all the stuff out. We don't read anymore. We don't pray anymore. We don't praise the Lord anymore. We don't give anymore. We don't pay our tithes anymore. We don't even put money in the offering plate anymore. We don't witness anymore. Uh, We don't give the missions anymore. We go, I'm free. I don't have to do any of that stuff. That stuff's religion. And listen, you got to let go of a bunch of stuff because some of it's just PTSD inducing and all it's going to do is scare you. And, And some of it just represents the darkness. Truly. You go, well, it wasn't dark. It was the Lord. No, it represents darkness. It represents death to you. Okay, so you got to let go, but you need to know this, whatever you let go, you let it go into Jesus. You let it go into the one who takes and represents things not made with hands, things not of this creation so that whatever comes out on the other side is a purified version of whatever went in. So the reason I titled this tonight, the, the tomb becomes a womb is I hope you can catch my drift is whatever goes into the tomb is actually gestating in a womb to be rebirthed is something better. So you may have got rid of all your spiritual disciplines That's right. and you might need to for a while because you only read your Bible because you had to. So guess what? You should probably stop reading it for a while because you don't have to anymore. But what you're probably going to find is that at some point you're going to need some scripture. Yes. And you know what's going to happen? If you don't ever read it, you're not going to know any of it. Don't expect God's going to drop a bunch of verses in your head. The minute you meet off with the devil and you go, boy, I wish I knew some Bible. And he goes, yeah, it'd be nice. Wouldn't it? Because that's what he'll say. Go, That'd be nice, wouldn't it? You know, you got 12 of them at your house. <laughs> you got 40 translations on your smartphone. You could stop playing the, the games you're playing on your phone and just, you know, 30 seconds of the word and just see what happens. That's not a condemning. I'm not condemning you. You can play, play games on your phone all day long while there's a Bible over there that rots. I don't care. The reality is, is that when you need the verse, you're only going to have the one you read. There it is. Reading it ain't going to get you to heaven. Reading it ain't going to save you. Reading it ain't going to make you one of the sons of God. Reading you ain't going to make close to God. Reading you is not going to make God love you. All that stuff's yours whether you read your Bible or not. But the moment you need a verse, you're going to need one you read. And so what happens is what we lay down, we got to pick up in Christ. And so if I can pick up, say I picked up Bible reading in Christ, I might start to read to see Jesus. Instead of reading to go to heaven or whatever all the reasons we read for. Reading to get my five chapters in. Check mark, check mark, check mark. Ooh, look at me, doing good. Instead, Father, show me Jesus. Yes. And let me tell you, man, when that happens, the Bible starts to explode. Yes. You think it's fun to stream a series on TV because you can't wait to see what happens next? Wait until you start to discover Christ in the text again. And you go, I got to get back in that scripture. I got to go see what happens, man. Because I'm reading it with new eyes. Yeah, I know that story, but I didn't know this Jesus existed. And I got to go see what he would do if he ran into that kind of person. And I got to go see what he would say if he ran into that situation. And it starts to explode because Jesus is recreating the things that we laid aside and he's fashioning them his image. Okay, guys, we got we to gotta, we gotta move because we got a lot of ground to cover. Not with blood of bulls and goats and calves, but his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all. He obtained an eternal redemption. How long is your redemption because of Jesus? It's right there. Next to last word. Sorry. Eternal. Look at that. You are not saved to your next sin. And do you know why you're not saved to your next sin? Because it's Jesus' blood, not a goat's blood. If it's a goat's blood, you've got to go offer another goat. But Jesus ain't going to die twice. Right. Jesus died once. So how long is your redemption good for? Eternal. Eternal. I, I, I can't say this enough. Your redemption is an eternal redemption. You've been bought with a price. What was the price? The blood of Jesus. How long does it last? Eternal. Forever. Eternal. It, there's no expiration date on the blood of Jesus. Jesus paid for an eternal redemption for all of us, 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified the puring of the flesh. I don't want to get bogged down in the weeds here. I'll just say this. Old Testament had rites of physical purification, sexual sins or touching a dead body or whatever that that disqualified the physical body from holiness. They had physical rites of purification in which you could sprinkle the blood of a dead animal into water 
and you could splash it upon or wash yourself off and your physical man would be clean. And so that's what the author of Hebrews is referencing. Because if that would work to purify the outside man, that's a very Jewish thing. Okay, we don't really understand this in our Christian terminology and I don't want to get bogged too, too slow in it. 14, how much more would the blood of Christ, if, if a bull and a lamb and a pigeon and a turtle dove and a goat could clean up your flesh, what would the blood of Christ do who through the eternal Holy Spirit offered himself without spot to God, how much more if you could sprinkle the endless redemption and endless Holy Spirit into your man, how much more would that cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve a living God? Cleanse your conscience from all the stuff you're doing to serve God. And you didn't have to do any of it to serve God. The minute you do something to serve God, it's dead works. You are service to God, not your actions. You are his son. Your life is a living sacrifice. Every step you take is in sacrifice to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. When you forgive, you're sacrificing your right to be right, your right to be avenged. You're laying it all down. Your whole life is a sacrifice. The stuff you do is not your sacrifice. The stuff you do is dead works. And a lot of what we're peddling on Christians is dead works. Do dead works. Do, we never say it that way because who's going to sign up for the dead work committee? But do dead works. Hey, sign up, do some dead works for Jesus. The reality is there's no work you can do for Jesus. He finished the work for you. He's not asking for you to do stuff. He's asking for you to be. I have come that you might have life. Not I've come that you might do stuff. I've come that you might have life and you might have life more abundant. And so in Christ is our life. I know it doesn't look like we're working on the Ark of the Covenant, but I promise we are. I'm just trying to spiritual. The author of Hebrews is spiritualizing what was once physical. Okay. So we're heading there. Verse 15. And for this reason, Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. That's that covenant we talked about at the end of chapter 8. Whatever's new, the old's ready to vanish away. For this reason, Jesus mediates a new covenant. And he does it by means of death. For the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Look at that. So Jesus has taken away and paid for all of the transgressions that could ever be committed under the first covenant. What was that first covenant? What was its hallmark? Thou shalt not. Don't, 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 don't. Ten Commandments? What's in? Okay, review. What's one of the things inside the Ark of the Covenant? Ten Commandments. And so Christ put his blood on the altar of heaven instead of a goat's blood and a bull's blood and turtle. Do he put his blood on the altar of heaven. You don't ever need to reapply. One application only. Jesus' blood is how long? Eternal. By the power of the eternal Holy Spirit so that you and I are redeemed from anything we ever did against the first covenant. Any breach we ever made against the law of God covered in Christ. Let me skip ahead to verse 24. Christ has not entered the holy place that was made with hands. That holy place, remember we got our fake curtain right here, the Ark of the Covenant's back here. This is the Holy of Holies. Christ didn't go into the holy place that's made with hands. He went into, the, into heaven to appear in the presence of God for us. So Jesus just skipped the temple. He didn't even bother to go in the temple at Jerusalem and go, I need to go behind that curtain. No, his temple is in the heavenlies. So whatever is in the natural temple is just a representation of the thing that's in the supernatural temple, which is in heaven. Verse 25, not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He doesn't need to do it twice, three times, four times, five times, six times. Jesus goes to the cross, resurrects. He takes this to his father, verse 26. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now... Once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. I just want you to stare at that for a second. What did he put away? Yeah. Sin by the sacrifice of himself. So you can't out sin the blood of Jesus. That's good. See that? Yeah. He put away sin 
by the sacrifice of himself. So Jesus and his blood becomes the object of our faith, not arcs of covenants, temples, feast days, natural works, stuff we can do, because Jesus has already replaced all of that. Jump to chapter 10. We're on our way. Verse 11. We're just moving left to right through this Hebrew source. We're, get, we're, we're jumping highlights, I realize. Verse 11. Every priest stands ministering daily, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which never take away sins. Look at that. I just told you that Jesus offered his blood for all sin one time. But what happens in the natural realm? They're killing lambs and goats and bulls, and it never does the trick. It never takes away sin. Verse 15. But this man, I'm sorry, verse 12, this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. And there are no chairs in the temple. And do you know why there are no chairs in the temple? Because chairs are for people at rest. And the priest was never done. When he walked into the temple, he was at work the whole time he was at work. No chairs. So where's Jesus? I got two questions for you. Number one, why does Jesus get to sit down? Number two, where's he sitting? Because it's finished. Because it's finished. And where's he sitting? Right hand of God. Right hand of the Father, exemplified as the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, it's a seat. Remember that from last night? It's a mercy seat, but nobody sits on it? Wait a minute. It ain't a seat if nobody sits on it. It is when Jesus does. Because the moment Jesus sits on it, it's a mercy seat slash propitiation seat slash satisfaction seat. His mercy endures forever. His propitiation endures forever. His satisfaction endures forever. Why? Because you got a forever sacrifice. And the one who gave the forever sacrifice is the one sitting on the seat. So Jesus has finished the work on your behalf, so he gets to sit down. And where is he going to sit? The only seat in the tabernacle. Because we all say there's no seats in the tabernacle, and I just said it to you. We're right. There are no seats in the tabernacle that people could sit on. There's only one seat in the tabernacle. It's the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And who sat there in the Old Covenant? Cloud by day, fire by night. When the cloud comes down, where do you put the Ark? Where's God sitting? Fire by night. When the fire comes down, where do you put the Ark? Right there. Where's God sitting? God sits on the mercy seat. So when Jesus sits down at the right hand of God, there's only one seat in the whole building. So Jesus parks himself on top of the Ark of the Covenant in the realm of the heavenlies. I don't mean literally. He's not sitting on a box tonight. But you get the allegory. That's the whole point of the chapters. That's what the author of Hebrews is doing. He's taking the things they understand to teach them something they don't understand. So he's showing the natural has transformed into the supernatural. So Jesus is seated at the right. And at the right hand of God doesn't mean that in the heavens, God's in one spot. And then Jesus is right over here, right next to God's right hand. And then, you know, who's over here on your left? Because that was how James and John were. It's like, who gets to sit on the left side? And Jesus goes, guys, that ain't how this thing works. The reality is, is you don't have to worry about in heaven tonight. There's God and there's Jesus sitting on a little box called the Ark of the Covenant. When you sat at the right hand, it was the position of great authority because warriors carried their sword in their right hand and their shield in their left. And so they could shield their left side, but they couldn't shield their right. So a king would put his number one man on his right side because his number one man was willing to die to shield his unprotected side. So to set at the king's right hand, many trusted you more than anyone in the universe. Yeah. When Jesus sets down at the father's right hand, it's God saying, there's my right hand man. That's where we get the phrase right hand man. You notice no one ever says that's my left hand man. That'd be stupid. That doesn't have any basis in reality, but that's my right hand man means that's the guy that matters the most. And so where's Jesus seated in the heavens at the right hand of the father because of what he's accomplished. Um, 13 from that time waits till his enemies are made his footstool. So everything's being brought under the feet of Jesus right now. Everything's being brought under the feet of Jesus. Everything. There's no powers that be that are not conquered under the feet of Jesus by one offering. I love this verse. I want you to savor this. Just let this go down smooth. All right, you ready? Jesus offered himself one time and he made perfect forever. Every one of you that are being sanctified. He perfected you. 
And you know why? Because he only can offer that one time. So he offered it and he sat down and you don't get to sit down unless the work's finished. And he went, all right, we're done. End of sin. Now here's where we put our mind in the mix and we go, well, ain't the end of sin because people are still sinning. And that's because we're thinking in the natural. We're thinking that the natural negates what he's done in the spiritual. Of course, people still fail. But because of Jesus, there is now therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Because he's perfected forever those who have been sanctified. Go to 19, same chapter. Therefore, therefore is another bend in the road. It's like but Christ. Therefore, when you see a therefore, you always find out what it's there for. In light of everything we've just read, here's your therefore. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest. Remember the curtain? What's behind the curtain? Holy of holies or the most holy place or the holiest place. So look what the author does now. Therefore, since Jesus is the one sitting in there, you get to have boldness to actually go through the curtain because of the blood of Jesus. But it's not an old temple with a big old raggedy curtain in it. It's a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil. But when I say veil, I really mean his flesh. The tearing of Jesus is the tearing into the access point of who God is and what God is. 21. And we have a high priest over the house of God. Let's draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience, your body washed with pure water. You don't have anything to worry about. Yeah, that's good stuff. You don't have anything to worry about. You get to, now, 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 now listen to this because this is, this is where all this spiritual becomes practical. If you're not walking into the presence of the Father to spend time with Him, you're only cheating yourself. Because the way has been paid for. So let's go back to all those disciplines we dumped off that we don't need anymore. Now that we're grace people, I don't need to read, I don't need to pray, I don't need to give, I don't need to go to church, I don't need to witness. <laughs> that stuff matters. If you know that you have a way into the holy place where Jesus is sitting on the ark to talk to you. That'll change what prayer means. Yes. Yeah. Or it should. Right? Mm -hmm. it, it isn't, oh God, I gotta get down on my knees, talk to God. No, it becomes, you mean I get to just go straight up to the Father and just sit there and just be in His presence and let Him form me? and shape me yes. and make me yes. and change me <laughs> and hug me and love me and speak over me. I get to have, I don't even have to pay for it. And I act like that's a chore. Like doing that is asking too much. Maybe it's because I don't understand what I have. Bingo. I think that's what happens when we dump the disciplines of what it means to live in Christ. A lot of times we dump them because they only represented pain. But when Christ died at Calvary, he pulled all of the pain into him and he stuck it in the coffin. And God doesn't know how to say it's over when you die. He only knows how to say, now it's time to get started because death is not an end for God. Death is a beginning. What did we say at the top of last night? Darkness and chaos is not the end for God. It's where God starts working. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And then God stepped up and said, let there be light. Because when all hell breaks loose, that's where God goes to work. The world began again on Easter Sunday morning. It started over. In God's economy, it started over. Jesus reset the clock of the eternal and said, I'm the new man on the earth. There was an Adam and now there's a last Adam. And let every man be judged in me, not in the first Adam. And he pulled all of our death and all of our junk into him so that the coffin of the Ark of the Covenant, the coffin of the covenant could become a womb for the resurrected Jesus. 
a place to birth something new so that whatever you put in there is transformed. Born again. Did you know what Jesus means when he says you must be born again? Here's what most of us thought that meant. That's, we think that means the day we get saved, right? Paul never talks about being born again. Paul does talk about salvation. Paul does talk about knowing Jesus. He talked about walking into the faith. He didn't talk about being born again. What did Jesus mean when he said born again? You see, I've been born again in Christ so many times I've lost count. I don't mean I've gotten saved over again. I mean I've been born again in that I put something old into the coffin of his cross and he resurrected something brand new in me that I'd never seen before. I've put pain in and he's resurrected peace. I've put shame in and he's resurrected confidence. I've put guilt in and he's resurrected wisdom. The stuff I've laid inside of the ark dies because it's beneath the blood. But born again is the experience of having Christ renew in us the life of the heavens over and over and over and over again in all of the areas of our lives that we're laying into that death. So your born again experience is an ongoing journey of who you are in Christ. At the end of the New Testament canon, let me say that differently. The end of the New Testament canon is Revelation. But that's only because we put that book last. It's not because it's the last book. There's pretty strong evidence that the last thing penned that ends up in the New Testament is the Gospel of John. John lives longer than any of his contemporaries. He doesn't die until the early second century. To our knowledge, he's the only original eyewitness of Jesus that makes it into the second century. The reason that's important is because some of the earliest great church fathers could link themselves as direct disciples to John, which gave them a direct link to Jesus. As deep as the late second century, we're getting church writings from guys who could trace their Christian lineage directly to Jesus. That either the person they come up under or the person above them had actually walked with Jesus. John is the last of those disciples to walk with him. And having seen the gospel stories play out in what we might call Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John sits down to write his gospel. And that's why we call John the non-synoptic gospel. It's non-similar in every single way to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. If you've never read John, read it. If you've not read John after reading Matthew, Mark, and Luke, do it that way too. And watch how from the minute it starts, it's not the same story. And I'm not going to go into all of it. I've went into some of it before. I just, I, I said all of that for this point. In, at every turn, here's our turns. At every turn in the story of Jesus, John decides to drop information and you didn't get before. And John is doing this to round out the gospel story of Jesus in the early second century. And I think that John's story of the resurrection is a way to spiritualize one final piece of the Old Testament story. Look with me real quick at John chapter 20 and verse number 11. Mary, on resurrection morning, stands outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. Now, before I read any other verse, I want to remind you of this, that all four Gospels tell you at the resurrection. All four Gospels make a big deal of the stone. You ever thought about that? They all, there was a stone over the door. They rolled the stone away. Who's going to roll the stone away? Two men showed up and rolled the stone away. Someone came in the middle of the night, rolled the stone away. All the Gospel writers are big on that rock. Man, they love the story of that rock. And you go, and, and a lot, of, when I was a kid, I would imagine the resurrection of Jesus having this boulder the size of the rock of Gibraltar in front of it that no man could possibly move, that it took the angels of heaven to move it. And logically, that can't be the case because how'd you get him in there in the first place? 
What'd you do? Hook up, you know, 4,000 yoke of oxen to a massive mountain and drag it across, halfway across Palestine and then put Jesus' dead body in it and then turn all the oxen around, put the ropes on the other side, then drag that rock to the other side. No, the rock was mobile enough that guys could move it. It wasn't like a rock moving was a miracle. But every gospel writer talk about that rock for the reasons, I believe, and they almost all call it a stone. They don't call it a mountain. They don't call it a boulder. They don't even call it a rock. They call it a stone. Because in the Hebrew consciousness, a stone was a finality. What were the Ten Commandments written on? Stone. stone. You put a stone in front of someone's grave because they don't come out. They're finally dead. They're really gone. And in the Hebrew mentality, the stone represented the law and it represented death. There's no other way to look at it. And so every gospel writer makes a big deal about moving the stone, move the stone, move the stone. You got to get the stone out of the way. And if you're a Hebrew reading that, it's you got to remove the thing that brought death in the first place. And if the law is written on stone and the stone covers the grave, then you got to get rid of something to get in that grave. All right. Keep that in mind. Mary stands outside the tomb weeping. She wept. She stooped. She looked down in. She saw two angels in white sitting. One at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And no other gospel writer puts two angels in the tomb. But John does. Because early in the second century, he's got one more piece of Jewish lore he wants to take care of. Because in the back part of the Jewish tabernacle is a little box that's also a coffin. And on top of that coffin are two cherubim. And one sets right here, and one sets right here. And their angels touch, their wings touch one another. And inside of it, on top of it's the presence of God, but inside of it is everything, the law is everything that's being replaced, that's being transported, that's being buried. And when John shows you the resurrection, he recreates the Ark of the Covenant. He puts two angels in the tomb, one at the head and one at the feet. So that when you look in, you'll realize that that old Ark of the Covenant is being replayed in front of your very eyes. That old coffin is being replayed in front of your very eyes where the body of Jesus had lain. Let's read this out, 13. And they said, woman, why are you weeping? She said, because they've taken away my Lord and I don't know where they laid him, 14. Now when she said this, she turned and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus is no longer inside the tomb. He's outside the tomb, right? She turns away from the tomb and there she sees Jesus resurrected. She didn't know it was him. Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She's supposing him to be the gardener. Said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I'll take him away. Can I give you this real quick? This, this, this gave me a lot of freedom years ago. I used to think that if you didn't have all your theology lined up just right, God wouldn't bless you. God wouldn't anoint you. God wouldn't touch your church. You had to fix it. We got to get this right, man. We got we to get the heart of God. We got to know exactly the right... Don't worry about getting it all right. Is she right? Can you go back one screen? Yeah, sorry. It's okay. Is she right? Is he a gardener? She's supposing him to be the gardener. Said, is, is Jesus the gardener? Or is he the resurrected Jesus? So he should ignore her, right? Because if you get your theology wrong, God's not going to give you the revelation. You know what helps me right here? She thinks he's a gardener, and he gives her the revelation of resurrection anyway. So quit worrying about whether you got all your theology right and just look for Jesus. Just look for Jesus, man. She thinks she's got a gardener on her hands. She doesn't even believe in the resurrection. She doesn't say, oh, he's resurrected. Can you tell me where he went when he came out of the grave? No, she thinks his body's been robbed. Hey, can you tell me where they took him? He's not alive. He's still dead. I just want to go anoint his body. And we're freaking out because we're wondering whether or not people got proper theology. Relax. Show them Jesus. That's the difference. Where'd you carry him? I just want to know where you've laid him and I'll take him away. 16. He said, Mary. And she turned to him and said, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. He calls her by name because that's how Jesus is. 
Do not cling to me. This is important. Do not cling to me. I've not yet ascended my father. Go to my brethren and say to them, I'm ascending my father and your father to my God and your God. He just showed her the Ark of the Covenant. The angel's wings, the cherub's wings touch one another. It's a place where things go to die. But Jesus isn't sitting on the old Ark of the Covenant anymore. He's standing outside of the tomb because what went into the tomb, what goes into the tomb actually is birthed from the womb of the Creator. Standing outside in a garden, which is a place where new things grow, stands Jesus, who's about to ascend to the Father to set down on a brand new Ark of the Covenant for you and for me, so that whatever we put in the crucified Jesus goes into the Ark of the Covenant so that it can be resurrected brand new in us. That's good news. Now, let me tell you why I did this this weekend. I actually did last night and all of tonight to get to this point right here. And this point right here is that there are three items listed in Hebrews chapter 9 inside the ark. Ten commandments. Aaron's rod that budded. And a pot of manna. Okay, right? Three items. Only one of those, Ten Commandments, are listed in the Old Testament. But Hebrews 9 says, no, there were actually three things. Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod that budded, a pot of manna. Everything that goes in goes into a coffin to be covered by the blood of Jesus so that it can come out resurrected in a new form. I did this entire introduction because what I really wanted to do this weekend was preach the three things inside the ark. I was going to preach one of them Friday night, one of them tonight, and one of them tomorrow. And thought, there's just a lot of stuff about that ark we need to know before we start taking the lid off. And you know what? I'm glad I followed that sound of the Spirit. Because I think the setup has been worth it. The squeeze has been worth the juice. It's been worth seeing where we could land with the revelation what the ark is. So here's how I'd like to handle the rest of tonight heading into tomorrow. I think most of us, by nature of having had a revelation of the love of God and the grace of God, have come to or are coming to the place where we realize we're not under the law. Right? Right. If I stood up here and did an hour on you're not under the law, I would be repeating much of what your pastor has done in trying to release you from performance anxiety for a God who is not anxious for your performance who has already fulfilled the law in Christ, and therefore you are free. So I don't want to spend an entire sermon releasing you from the Ten Commandments because I know that you know it. But I do want to spend about 10 minutes because I think I could add some quality to understanding that I've been released from the performance standards of the law, but I'm not lawless. Okay? And then tomorrow, Aaron's rod that budded and a pot of manna. Boom, boom. One Sunday morning sermon. And you don't want to miss it because, man, do you need to know why you're freed from those two. Because you might be hearing those and go, big deal, Aaron's right about a pot of manna, who cares? Good stuff in that coffin. You need it in that coffin so you can see what you have on the other side of the coffin, right? What happens when we roll the stone out of the way and the new man comes out? So we'll get to those two tomorrow. But let's land right here tonight. Romans chapter 10, verse 4. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Here's point number one. The law doesn't make anyone righteous. Jesus put an end to anybody thinking it did. If you'll look at Jesus, what you'll learn is that the righteous, the law keeping can't make you righteous and law breaking can't make you unrighteous. Not if you actually believe what Jesus did for you on the cross. If Christ went to the cross as the ultimate sacrifice, and we just walked through Hebrews that told you, you don't need to kill bulls, lambs, pigeons, turtle doves, or goats anymore. Why not? Because you've had one forever eternal redemption offered by the death of Jesus Christ. If that's the case, why aren't we offering up lambs and pigeons and turtle doves? Are we not sinning anymore? Of course we're sinning, but we've already had one blood shed for all sins, and therefore breaking the law cannot make me unrighteous any more than keeping the law can make me righteous because Christ died as my righteousness. 
God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might be the righteousness of God in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21. So if Jesus became my sin, I become his righteousness. So you take the Ten Commandments and you put them in a coffin because none of them are going to make you better in the eyes of God by keeping them. And so what goes into a coffin comes out of an empty tomb. In other words, what goes in comes out better. So I am freed from the law for my righteousness, but I'm not free from the law. I've been set free from the law of sin and death by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, Paul said. So I've been released from the law that killed me, which was the law that said, do, 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 don't, 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 do, 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 don't, don't, don't. That'll kill you. And if that don't kill you, you'll kill the guy that keeps going, do, 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 don't, don't, because that's annoying. Somebody's going to die either way, right? So there's death. Paul even said there's death attached to what I thought brought me life. Because it doesn't bring me life. It just brings me death. So put it in where, where, where do dead things go? In a coffin. So it, brought, it ain't going to bring you life, so put it in a coffin. But you've been released from the law of sin and death, and you're in the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which means you're not actually out from the law. You just do not have the law for righteousness. If it's buried in the ark, it needs to resurrect when the stone rolls away, right? Because we're not people of death, we're people of life. So when the law comes out, what's it look like? Romans 13, 8. Before before you put it up, leave that right there. Can you go just show, okay, just leave that right there. Okay. Put that in your memory banks, all right? You need to know this. I want to say this to grace people. Listen, grace people, I want to say it so loud and clear. We've preached, you're not under the law, you're not under the law, you're not under the law, you're not under the law. And we love those verses. And I just stood up here and quoted them like I've known them my whole life because I've quoted them all over the world. But we don't go on in the same book by the same writer, Paul, to the same audience, Rome, and read what he actually says the law being fulfilled would look like. Because if I go around and ask most people in grace churches, what does it mean to say that Jesus fulfilled the law? They will say it means Jesus never sinned and then he died because we're sinners. And so I go, okay, well then what would it be to fulfill the law? They go, to fulfill the law would be that you didn't sin. And since you're never going to be able to do that, you're never going to be able to fulfill the law. That's what most people think. Right. But Jesus had a guy come up to him one time and say, what's the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said, what do you... Oh, the greatest commandment of the law is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, love your neighbor as yourself. And the guy had the audacity to go, that's right. I always thought that was kind of cocky. Like you would say to Jesus, well, that's right. Good job. Like, what do you know? But the guy goes to Jesus, goes, that's right. And Jesus goes, you're not far from the kingdom if you'd live that. Ooh, that's big. You're not far from the kingdom if you'd love God and love your neighbor. So I propose to you that Jesus did not fulfill the law because he was sinless. By the way, he was sinless if you believe the Bible. But that's not what made him fulfill the law. This is what made him fulfill the law. Romans 13, 8. Owe nobody anything except to love one another for he... Uh-oh, here it comes. He who loves another has fulfilled the law. Bingo. The law was trying to get you to treat your neighbor better. That's why it told you don't cheat on your wife. Don't cheat on his wife. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't take his stuff. And we looked at it and went, if you'd stop murder and steal and commit adultery, you'd go to heaven. God went, no, 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 no. That's not what it was for. That's what you turn law into is a measuring stick of whether or not you're good. And that's what we always do. Because what we do is we figure out what we're doing right and what other people are doing wrong. And we judge what other people do wrong and we applaud what we do right. And it becomes a method of self-righteousness where we are the ones who are righteous. And God goes, no, you were my people before I gave you the law. The law was so you'd get off your neighbor's property and quit stealing his spouse and killing his kids and beating up his dog. Leave his stuff alone for Pete's sake. If he's hungry, feed him. If he's poor, help him. If he don't have a house, give him a room. Pick him up when he falls down. Stop abusing him. Stop violating him. Stop raping him. Stop molesting him. Stop crushing him. Stop fighting him. Stop beating him up. And you're not any good at that. This is God talking. He goes, you're not any good at that. So here's some rules. 
to help you. If you loved one another, you'd fulfill the law. Read on. Verse 9. All right, you ready? Here we go. Here's New Testament quoting the Ten Commandments. At least the Ten Commandments that deal with each other. You ready to rock? Here's the Apostle Paul, by the way. The commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Don't covet. That's the big back five, by the way. The back five have to do with me and you, right? And if there's any other commandment, and Paul knows there is, but who's got that kind of time? We're only writing one letter. You gotta don't list them all off. So I'll tell you what, if you can think of any others, can you think of any others in the Old Testament? Okay, you probably can. So if you can, bundle them all in there too. They're all summed up in one saying, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, there you go. There's why I gave you those laws, because you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. Now watch verse 10. Love wouldn't harm a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. So what did Jesus do? He loved his neighbor. How did Jesus fulfill the law? Love By loving his neighbor. You want to know where he fulfilled it? This is why it's okay to say he fulfilled it on the cross. You ready? Because on the cross, he said, Father, forgive, forgive them. They know not what they do. And there's no love like forgiveness. Mm. Right. So At Calvary, Jesus fulfilled the law. But in his day-to-day -day life, Jesus fulfilled the law. So I say to you, you've put the Ten Commandments into the Ark of the Covenant where they belong. So let them die for righteousness. Don't you ever again think that when you fail, you're not the righteousness of God. And don't ever think you can do good and God's all excited and declares you righteous. Get rid of that. That's dead and gone. The stones rolled away. There's a brand new understanding of the law. And it's been resuscitated in Jesus. And it looks like this. If he smites you on the cheek, turn to him your other one. If he asks you to go a mile, go two. Love your enemy. Pray for your persecutor. It's the same old story with brand new equipment. And I'm going to stop with this thought. The new equipment is this. A new commandment I give unto you, Jesus said, that you love one another as I have loved you. So take the love of Jesus. You ready? Take the love of Jesus and use it. Yeah. How do you use it? Go love somebody. Guess what we just did? We just put the law inside the coffin. We splashed the blood of Jesus on it. We rolled the stone away and we brought him out and set him on a brand new Ark of the Covenant. Which means that the law has been redeemed in Christ. Don't think it can make you righteous. You're already righteous. But don't think it's gone. You're still supposed to love people. Amen. Now, if the church would preach that, yeah. we'd change the world. Right. If the church would preach... But we don't. We're so excited about the death side of the law. We don't want to put it in the ark. We just want to hang it up in front of people and condemn the living fire out of them every time we get together. And it's just because we haven't had enough... Ex we haven't went behind the veil enough to see that Jesus is the one sitting there. Father, thank you. You're so good. This has been fun. It's been fun tonight to point the spotlight on Jesus. I pray that when people leave tonight, if they don't remember the verses and they don't remember the illustrations, that's fine. But if they'll just remember what we're supposed to be doing is facing Jesus the one who's seated at the right hand of the Father, the one who rose from the grave so that we could have life, then, Father, everything else will begin to sort itself out. And as we have placed in that tomb what we were, may we have a revelation tonight that it has become a womb by which you have birthed a new thing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.